Yes. Where's Deb? We are live. We're on YouTube. All right. Welcome to <laughs> virtual traveling, Molly's people out there in the audience in YouTube land. Yes, yeah. good evening, everybody. Welcome. And uh, how many months is this now, Nina, that we've been doing this? We started in April, right? Or no, it was May. It's about uh, 2,700 months. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, uh, virtually. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, no, no. It feels like it's been forever. Yeah. And the great thing about it is that we get to have these fabulous features from all over the country um, that we wouldn't be able to get in otherwise. And tonight we have as our feature, uh, my friend, Tim Siebels. And why don't we just do the, this yeah. clapping things or if you're muted, you can <laughs> do yeah. this. Or Tim, you can say hello, you're out there. You're muted. Uh, un unmuted. Hello, hello friends, hello. I'm so glad you're all here. I don't want to take the time from the open mic though. Okay. That's okay. Um, it would be great if those of you out in YouTube land would uh, just sign in, just give us your information so we know who's out there. And uh, after Tim reads, we're gonna have a Q&A so you'll also be able to um, ask any provocative questions or whatever, we'll get them. Yeah, we'll do our best to monitor the YouTube questions, but obviously anybody from the open mic is still is still live and uh, able, able to speak. Um, in the real world over the past, whatever many years we've been doing the, the, the Molly's, Traveling Molly's open mic, Nina and I usually start so that nobody in the open mic has to be first. So Nina, do you want to go first this month or would you like me to? Why not? Okay. You know, I, um, I'm going to dedicate this poem to our president elect who is about to see a world of grief. Well, he's already been seeing it, but, um, you know, as we went up to the, um, came up on the, um, debates, I was like, white knuckling it like I sure hope he doesn't screw up and you know turns then we find out that um he was a stutterer when he was young and sometimes when he's in stress like when you're being attacked by a monster you know he could it, you risk falling into that my dad was a, a really bad stutterer and um I didn't really realize that when I was young because I just thought that talking like that was normal. So I'm gonna uh, read the stutterer. Sometimes a single word seems determined to bring him to his knees. It is by all appearances a mild and unassuming word but he finds himself standing before it as yet another wall without doors. His moist palms clench and unclench, eyes blinking earnestly in their sockets. His face begins to twist, contorting as syllables stick like flies to the cobwebs of his tongue. As always, the moment pr prolongs itself precarious and still, but for bullets of sound sprayed at the unsuspecting silence. Cheeks burning red to purple fringe the calm unblemished air, while in the stillness, listeners twitch, windows gape, and outside crows convened on the backyard fence like a Greek chorus banter, banter with an enviable fluency. Good luck, Joe Biden. You'll also have Kamala to speak for you if it gets uh, too challenging. <laughs> oh, thanks, Nina. Um, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm going to read a uh, poem. I think with now that the election's over and we can start looking at other news and other issues again, one of those is um, 
which of course started in in quite a loud way this past summer was the um, Black Lives Matter um, protests. And I've been writing a series of poems for a few years now about um, growing as a white person growing up with racism. And I truly believe that um, that's where it has to start, that um, the white part of our country has to just bear witness to what we all grew up with. So this is one of those poems. Of, this is one of the first ones to be published by a journal. And um, I'll, re I'll read it, I'll read it now. This is called The Privileged Blues. What right, this white boy, to play blues, as if with his shiny saxophone he could know the black of blues. In 1982, alone I listened, waited for my turn to take a place on stage at the Kingston Mines Monday Night Blues Jam. I kept coming back week after week alone, but jamming and sitting in and being invited on gigs. I earned a nickname, Bossa Nova, but not a spot in the back seat out in the alley on breaks. Not even after Lefty Diz announced to packed house Saturday night applause, now that boy has the blues. Not when I told Big Gary with his vintage King tenor sax, you've got the sound and he said, but you've got the fire, especially not after 4 a.m., sore lip gigs, all night on stage, a plastic beer cup at my foot, and breaks of wild turkey shots when I walked haltingly home alone, five blocks to my shared bathroom rooming house studio, street lights and long shadows, almost dawn. No cop ever pulls up to check my blue eyes, my saxophone case in hand to accuse, where you going, boy? Oh my God, I love that, Al. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yep, there's a, a few of those that I've got out there now, so we'll see what happens. Um, so let's get started with the uh, the open mic. Um, I don't know who was who was uh, with joined us first, but uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Patty McMillan to start out this week, this month. Thanks. Uh, actually, Robbie was here before me. Oh, okay. But I was late. <laughs> but I'll just step right in. Um, good evening. I decided I would, I would avoid political speech just for tonight. Plus, I haven't gotten anything ready. Um, tonight is the 82nd anniversary of Kristallnacht. Uh, the day in which, uh, whoa, there goes my phone, sorry. Um, <laughs> this is live. Live. Zoom. Okay. Um, the day in which the, uh, the Holocaust began to become real to Berliners, Jewish and non-Jewish. This was among other things, um, a Lutheran pastor named Martin Niemöller uh, began to think out his his words that that was based on the fact that others other interest groups had been persecuted before the Jews. But the poem that I chose is by the poet. I'm not sure how to say it. I, A-I, mm -hmm. who's, uh, who adopted that name. It means love in Japanese. She was a mixed race um, American born in 1947 in Albany, Texas, died in 2010. And she wrote this poem called Kristallnacht. The Jewish, Jewess, stood behind the millinery shop window and cursed us. And it seemed like the great wind of the Bible was there with her among the felt, the straw, and feathers. Her tongue was a snake. Medusa, I thought, and knew I'd turned to stone. I had to stop her. My voice and the voices of the other good citizens of Berlin was a black wave filled with stars that would wash over the Jews and suspend them in atonement and broken glass. I threw one rock and another and realized I was alone. 
Glass was everywhere, even in my hair, and the Jewess laid at my feet, her blood on my pants, my shirt. I turned my face up, and glass fell in my eyes, and it felt like water, only water. Antoine, somebody calls me. Antoine, it's raining. Come inside. I walk back through the window where the Jewess is still standing and past her, where you are bending, my love, over the ink block with the brush raised above the paper where the Japanese character for heaven is drying. You look up. And this is, this is my poem. Um, again, avoiding almost all current events it's called World Series. <clears throat> it's not like one day you're a boy in a small Cuban town, never heard of AstroTurf, and the next day you're 20, living in a grown-up body, and the bats shrunk. You eat hot dogs on American bread with American mustard, to be polite. And when you do chest bumps, you have to watch you don't hurt someone. Once in a while, you felt like you should maybe think about doing something else, driving a truck slaughtering hogs, cooking, but something's kept pushing you. Something's told you this is who you are, the only thing you're sure you have. So here you are, two and two, bottom of the seventh, bases loaded, eyeing a high slider, letting it go, and it's three and two, and the next one's in the air coming fast. Could be 95, 96 miles per hour. Every sinew in your body reaches points to center left. It's almost like you don't need a bat, just stone hard will. Thanks. That was, of course, dedicated to Randy Arosarena. By the way, Chico, I, uh, I saw you nodding in approval. Um, Chico is our... Uh, How to lay off the, the high slider, <laughs> especially with two strikes. <laughs> genuine and authentic uh i had to have that chico will remember he once critiqued a poem because i had two plastic headphone earphones instead of one and it was just out of context chico i read that to my boyfriend over the phone tonight and he corrected i was going to say it's two and three and he said no 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 it can't be two and three it's <laughs> three and two <laughs> i know that <laughs> So just to, as a reminder, it occurs to me that um, not everybody has read here before, so I just want to uh, remind you that you've got five minutes um, to read and introduce your stuff. So um, moving right along. Oh, and also know that when you arrived and or when you signed up has absolutely nothing to do with when you will read, you will read when Al or I feel like calling you. So I'm about to call up uh, Richard Nestor. Uh, Richard, good to have you here. Hmm. Richard is caught in the belly of the beast. Uh, I could I can read, but that's all I can do. I can't do any of this stuff. Okay, all right. I'm going to read uh, two poems. Uh, the first one is uh, from uh, my third book called Penguin Love, and it's called Restraint. Have you seen that documentary, PBS, I think, about the development of restraint in children, a part of the maturation process? For those who haven't seen it, they put a marshmallow in front of a child and leave the room. Children love marshmallows. I don't anymore, but I remember loving them so I can identify. It's a great thing for humans, identification. Wolves too. Without it, we'd be a race of serial killers, which from an evolutionary standpoint isn't adaptive, at least not for long. But that's another point. The kids are told if they wait 10 minutes without eating the marshmallow, 
they'll be given two marshmallows. It's harder than you think. Think eggnog available all year, not just at Christmas. You can hear me repeating the word marshmallow, marshmallow right now as I try to simulate the way desire echoes and builds. One of the uses of repetition in poetry when it's not serving dread or some other useful figment of human will and process. It's cute the way the kids distract themselves, being adult for little slices of time, as adult as we can be, only for longer until the time passes. You know how it is. The violin, for instance, which might take an age to learn, or even worse, the trumpet, before there's one clear note. Most of them make it, but there's a few that go nearly mad. 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Such articulate raving that you might think that they are little leers. Our cat is like that, stark animal three times each day, all of which makes me think that restraint is the best human thing there is, except when it's not the best. Yeats wrote a poem about that, about the best and worst, without saying anything about when each is appropriate and how to start doing right if you're already satisfied doing wrong. <laughs> okay. Uh, the next one is from my first book, uh, which Tim Siebel's generally blurred. Gen, gen, generously blurbed many years ago. It's called Adaptation. Relentless devouring polyphemi on TV, the Borg or the enemy. Defeated by human quickness, they return from each commercial, cocksure as drunks, but pressed, as though there were dry cleaners as well as taverns just off stage. Tell me, if scientists are right and the basic score of the universe is always tied, how come the Borg and all their cultural eating never learn to paint, tap dance, slam dunk, never emerge as Richard Pennyman, little Richard claimed he had, a king and queen of rock and roll? Wouldn't you, given the chance, Come back with everything you need, peach ice cream, tits, Mozart, and a two-car garage. Well, that's TV for you, Pat Boone and light beer forever. In real life, we are Borg, human ones, minus the epic armor, who chew the great reception desk of indifference into the bits we live with and on. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. All right. Yeah, hope you'll join us again. I'm, um, I'm looking for our list and I'm thinking, um, who should I call up to next to the open mic? <laughs> um, Deborah, you want to you wanna read for us? Deborah. Sure. Yeah, that's me. Huh. So um, years ago, I was part of the prose section of this open mic, and then I took a break, and then I came back and I was reading some poetry, but I read my last poem the last time I read, which was right when COVID was settling in. And uh, so now I'm back to prose. And I'm writing uh, in honor of Nano Remo. I'm not writing a novel, I'm writing uh, vignettes like memoir, but I'm trying to write every day. So this is one of them. I am having fun writing about myself uh, in memoir form. And um, I'm not sure what the title of this one is, but uh, it'll take about four minutes to read. When I was 16 and in my last year of high school, I came home one day and my mother, who hadn't been feeling well for reasons that were confusing her doctors, had fallen into a coma and was hauled away in an ambulance and did not return. She was on a ventilator and died the next day. My dad had decided to take her off, a decision that broke him. 
though of course he survived. We all survived except my mother who was suddenly and irrevocably gone and we were all broken. My father had a different leave taking, developing troubling symptoms while in his late sixties, also confusing to doctors, but ultimately becoming sadly clear that he had started to suffer from a neurological illness. Over many years of testing and prescribing, it became evident that he had Parkinson's and later an autopsy revealed he also had Alzheimer's, but the details of the diagnosis are not the point. The slow decline is. My family and I lived through it and nurtured him and helped him find the small joys of daily life over his last decade, his grandchildren especially, by their presence, their energy, their humor and patience. There was nothing sudden about his departure. He lost bits and pieces of himself over many years until finally in a hospice bed in our home, we put our hands on his chest and felt him take his last peaceful breath, then felt his body go from warm to cold in what seemed a matter of minutes. He was 82, I was 53, I became an orphan. I read somewhere about losing a loved one suddenly with no time to prepare to say goodbye, the deep hole of shock and dismay that death leaves in contrast with watching someone age or get ill and struggle and decline, which is painful, but allows time for acceptance and relief if the loved one is suffering. Losing my mother suddenly at 16 in 1974 has left me with a lifetime of wondering about her, the conversations we might've had, her reaction to the decisions I have made about how to live my life, about how to raise my children or about the state of the world, of politics, of the dashing of the belief that she shared with my dad that a better world was really around the corner, somewhere visible and palpable. My dad, on the other hand, lived through many years of the erosion of that dream. And we had the chance to talk about it and process it, had the chance for so many other conversations as well about me, my life, my children, my work, my marriage, my divorce, my sisters, their children, an enormous amount of words and shared moments to go over and remember. In these years of orphanhood, I feel my parents' presence inside of me in a mixture of conjecture and remembrance that their very different deaths have left. They died almost 40 years apart, and my father got to be an old man while my mother stayed forever young, and so I tend to think of them separately as if they were not a parental unit. But recently I found a photo that pulled them back to, into the togetherness of being my parents. The two of them, likely in their late 30s, are sitting on the concrete seawall built to protect the lakeshore of the camp they directed in what was then a rural farming area outside of Milwaukee. The waterfront was the center of that camp, which offered a challenge and a respite to kids from the inner city, many of whom had never been in water before, hadn't canoed or skied or spent a lazy day on a pontoon or hiked through tall grass prairie. My parents are sitting close to each other, their bodies touching, but it is not a romantic photo. It is a photo from the middle of their workday. They are both wearing dark sunglasses and they both have dark curly hair and strong noses. They look so Jewish. My mom is wearing a multicolored sweater that I remember well. Their expressions are focused and concentrated, looking outward towards the swim area, which was a place of pleasure and fun, but was taken quite seriously water safety was a religion. My parents are surrounded by kids, all arms and legs and smiles, black kids, white kids, brown kids, a gorgeous multiracial jumble. That was their dream. They must have been living in their idea of paradise, a world that took time, energy, worry, commitment, and hard work to organize, to make sure that 100 people bonded into some kind of community, that nobody got seriously injured or drowned, or even got so homesick they couldn't stand it. <coughs> Excuse me. The photo surprises me. They're my parents reunited if I travel backwards in time. And I know the sound of their voice, their touch, the colorful loops of lightweight cotton that make up the sweater my mom is wearing, the smell of my dad's aftershave. I know their deep commitment to living the way they wanted, their laughter, their love of conversation and ferocious debate about ideas. I know all of this deeply and intimately. But as I, as I scrutinize the photo, it suddenly grows distant and somehow disembodied from me. <clears throat> I see them not as my parents, but as two youthful, hip, smart, organized people living out a kind of life that still eludes most of us in the years that have followed. Black, white, brown, kids, water, a breeze, the joy of togetherness, laughter, 
responsibility for each other. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you. So Chico, how about you? You ready? You know, one of the things that I miss about uh, being at the Buzz, uh, Buzz Cafe is the, the hiss of um, the cappuccino maker and the espresso maker. It's... You really miss that? I can add it if you like. <laughs> <laughs> so- uh, This is just a click away, Nina. All you have to do. Yes. Don't believe a word I'm saying. Somebody wow. just drop a plate and that will be, you know, smash something on the ground. I imagine I had a week like uh, many of you did, uh, but it ended up pretty good until I realized that um, Joe Biden has eight years on me. And here I was planning to retire next summer. And it occurred to me that for the next four years, at least, maybe longer, um, my wife will be able to point to Joe and say, look, he's on the job. Get off your lazy ass and go to work. So I got a few shorties here on uh, the week that was. The candidate I'll be voting for stops his campaign train in our town. And when he opens his trap to address us, out pours the toots, honks, whistles, and lonesome horn blasts that he lets take the place of his voice, knowing these sounds are what will put us to sleep during these troubles and what will also awaken us to go patiently and with resolve back to work again. The pandemic is over, people will kiss like on VJ day and hook up and swallow the precious bodily fluids of one another. And our diseases will go back to the good old days of chlamydia, syphilis, herpes simplex number two. When Trump took the golden elevator down to open his campaign for president, he must have thought poor Orpheus who needed music instead of wealth. This is the way he should have traveled to wow the keepers of the underworld. There's so much COVID-19 in the air that any bullet flying through it starts to cough and weaken and needs to go lie flat on its back before it reaches its target. We who remember our old wide open lives will tally up our losses and those of us unmasked will not succumb to random or intended violence yet to die of natural causes. So warm on election day, the ice cream truck plays turkey in the straw outside the polling place. When doomsday comes, it will be on a Tuesday so that it can keep on being the only ooh day of the week. Standing in line six feet apart for the 2020 election, the voter in front of me says quietly the names of presidents whose administrations we have forgotten. Franklin Pierce, Calvin Coolidge. The voter in front of me whispers the names of the close second place finishers who almost became president. The wait will be long, I call out softly so only the ones ahead of me and behind can hear. The name I save for my old love who in a winter long ago passed warmth back and forth between us as if we were passing laws that would make a life a little easier and give people more time to say over and over the words that make each one happy. Election night. After I bit all my nails to the quick, I, built, I bit the nails in the coffin of democracy, or maybe it was just mine, then bit the nails used to hammer Jesus of Nazareth's hand to the cross. Then very late as the absentee ballots were counted, I dared to bite your nails with the polish on them that tasted of cherries from my backyard tree when I was a boy and the president was Ike. I can't wait for Puerto Rico to become a state of the union so I can stay up till three in the morning on the next election night to see if they will turn red or 
Love, after every election day, I so want to tell you in your realm that welcomes all immigrants and pilgrims, that here where nothing falls as gently as the last of the leaves, it is morning in America. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Thank you for that. Thank you. I love that. Thank you, Bob. Um, who should we call next? Well, since Robbie was the first one here, Robbie Nestor. Hi. I hadn't planned to read this poem, but since I'm sitting in the skeleton of a blue whale, I might as well. This is the first poem in my book, Narrow Bridge, which was published by Main Street Rag in 2019. It's called The Making. If Beethoven were a whale, he would groan a song as monumental as his bulk. One the waves would write, always in suspension. They would take an hour to break along a shore so distant, none of us could fathom where it was. Deaf yet full of music, he would weave with song the ice blue play of sun on Arctic water, surge of rain on turquoise surf, conjuring the other creatures of the ocean as he sang. Mantis shrimp, constant as castanets, booming grunts and groupers, dolphins chatter in static bursts, the electrical hum of moon jellies, a thousand cast off planets drawn through the ocean like a comb through flowing hair. While choruses of belugas, blue whales, near sighted narwhals would contribute a plaintive descant line. To start, he would have sung the molten earth, hot and smoking the burning mountains shedding pools of tears where this whale, the only living creature, could circulate the globe, singing the world into being. My second poem, I, I succumb to the mood of the moment. So I'm gonna read this poem called Diplomacy. O oh, enemy, O oh, friend, you are closer than my ear. I dream night after night of your face, larger in the shadows than my own, as we circle one another, two planets caught in a pas de deux. For years, we have studied one another imagining how to strike. Yet in truth, we have not come closer than a thought, flaring our fins like fighting fish, beautiful in our fury. What if we break these glass walls? Will we at last come face to face with ourselves, hands hanging weaponless at our sides, armed only with our voices, our human voices. Thanks, thanks, Robbie. Um, Jennifer, Jen Steele, thanks for joining us tonight. Yes, thank you for having me. I was saying, I'm like, I'm not gonna fan draw. <laughs> so I'm just really excited to read with everyone. Um, and so thank you for having me. I'm gonna read, uh, I have two poems and they both are relevant um, to the moment in different ways. So the first poem I'm gonna read, um, so today my son had a lesson on Native American Heritage Month. And it was really awesome to be able to share with him a piece of our own heritage today, just to say, oh, this is where, you know, our members of our family, your ancestors were members of, the, of these two different tribes. Um, and so um, this poem is really talking about what it means to, um, what it means to not wholly know 
um, where you come from or what your history is, um, and then being able to make history for yourself or to be able to appreciate your the heritage that when we can hold it, we hold it. When we can't, we, we find our own heritages within ourselves. Um, so this is called Trust Fall. Um, and it includes a, it includes a um, phrase um, in Epic, which is a Nigerian language, which means I love you. Uh, so this is Trust Fall. Oh, so both my poems are also love poems. I think it's a great time to talk about love. So <laughs> Trust Fall. On a summer night along the Connecticut River, we are stealing time from the curfew of a park where no one but a fisherman joins our company and my tongue keeps calling a mosquito a king. Sitting on a railing between me and the water, my fingers loosened without warning from the swallow of your neck, investigating your reflexes and how long the weight of my body pushing against your forearms will hold. You try to teach me about other muscles and how my tongue can shape itself into song. Lend me your language under stars, but I fail the notes over and over. I don't want to sing or trepid my guilt for not knowing the origin of my skin or what languages are christened in the caverns of my taste buds. I won't butcher the beauty, expose the truth I carry in my unrooted mouth. All I know is that I am a girl who enjoys falling backwards without warning into the middle of the night and the thrill in the risk of not being caught in time. I tell you I can't sing, but you smile and say, I am getting there. I've got you, me mafi, no matter how many times the king is a mosquito. Hmm. Thank you. Um, so this other poem I'm going to read is from um, my chapbook, A House and Its Hunger. And um, a mentor of mine, Ethelbert Miller, told me there aren't enough poems about love on Black campuses. So I, in the spirit of being a Howard alum, <laughs> I feel like it's only appropriate <laughs> to read a poem um, about, you know, about love, having experienced love on a college campus and, and remembering love. Um, so this poem is called Dear You. Years after our footsteps have washed away, I consider the rain coming down in DC, the broom straw of each bead come and gone, the grip of a howling wind, its cleansing or flooding of colorful row houses opposite my table in a cafe in a still open window. I've walked past every monument we built like a wound imagined running my fingers along the brick and glass of the convenience store doorway we ducked into to get out of the beating of a summer sky we never expected to split so wide and sudden and pushed us so close it made no sense not to make a moment for a kiss. Forget our soaking, our long distance from home. Maybe if I kneeled down right in the middle of the sidewalk, and press my cheek to the concrete, I could hold us again. Resurrect what the waters only moved, stored away in the clouds cabinets, in case one of us came back for our lost, like a quarter or a single earring caught in a dustpan and found just in time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Very nice. Um, Next up, uh, Leonard Lund, your turn. Yes, I'm here, I'm here. Uh, nothing political, uh, by education and inclination, I'm a historian. And uh, I think in the 57 years I've been writing poetry, I may have written a dozen contemporary at the time, political pieces. Uh, find it much more interesting when the dust is settled. <laughs> so the, the usual sort of things. Uh, none of these have been published. None of these have been read before. And uh, I had to blow a lot of dust off of them. I can't find the picture you sent me or the letter it was wrapped in. 
But it's been so long, like everything else, I'm really not surprised when searching for traces is futile. You were standing by a table, perhaps in class or your dorm, close to a nude torso mannequin done a la Anne Boleyn, your eyes on the camera, the future. The letter went on about the hangar wire armature, the joy in tearing up the National Enquirer for paper mache, and how you arrived at the blue skin with spattered constellations. The artist near 50 telling of what an earlier self had done. Were you also the model? And would you do another? Are questions I never asked with answers, answers you'll never offer. Beneath the stars, the sun, moons encircling worlds that hold them captive, clouds create a fluid wall, obscuring dream vision where and what might be. Beneath the clouds, the birthplace sees. And in the rainy space between our lives, loves, losses equally defined by water, by tears of joy and sadness, crying out. Beneath the tides of woe, almost drowned, we're awash and wash our hands or wring them and falling in each other's arms, lovers or paramours are sheltered in the storm. And lastly, that song comes on and you take a slow, deep breath. Close your eyes to the pain. The rumor of her death was nothing more. You know that now, which makes everything harder. When you're reminded by a tune you can name in one note or the mention of a certain tree, a street in Germany, children's toys. The urge to write is almost too much. The act of mentally composing a letter, automatic like that breath. But there are metal racks in memory's store filled with postcards unwise to send. Poems that can't be written yet. All art imitating life. Thank you all. It's good to be back. Thank you. So I get to, uh, by reading submissions for the Woman Made series, I get to, Anne Marie, don't go too far too fast. Um, I get to learn about poets that I wouldn't otherwise know of. And um, I don't remember what was the first um, reading that you submitted for, but I just loved your work. And I'm so glad you're with us tonight. So this is Anne-Marie O'Connell. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me. If you hear a dog snoring, she's here. <laughs> um, okay. So I'm just gonna read a few poems, just short ones. Um, if the beginning is a word, it is combat, the dust of marching feet falling through my fingers. I am a girl raising a man to my lips and drinking. No matter what version they tell you, I never come apart. I am against everything, but you, I taste berry after berry. You come from war, some uninvited guest burning alive in my body, ashes in my stomach. We are living drunk when you lay your neck on the railroad tracks. All this here steel like wide green water separating us in one quick stride. You cry about bodies on top of more bodies and I don't speak. From air drones and machetes to 63rd Street, you stun me. Your words, when they, when they come, warm me from the ground up. I should say these these poems are from a chapbook that's going to be published. It's supposed to be published in February. 
Um, so. <clears throat> when I cleaned other people's houses, it was feed sewn about everywhere, full of endless time clocking me around the room, chocolate covered rooms. Once one of the owners wish whispered, you should think about getting more out of life. As if I wasn't already born like this, hanging on the hem of her dress. My little son's footsteps are close to me now. Consider this a secret I want him to know about. The night is still made for us. How do you like it? Consider this secret. When I'm not alive enough, I find him in the apartment just to feel his tiny mouth on my cheek. Stepping into his shadow of joy means I'm actually rising. People like us go home to the sound of a saw in the winter wind. People like us ripple up the holy water. No one can tell you're even shuddering until you sit by the shutdown newspaper stand in the middle of the day. A man glances up at you so intently, like you are a photograph of a woman pounding her fists into glass. And right where the sun splits the bench in two, a boy sits like the scar on your brother's cheek from a gangbanger who took glass to his face. Don't forget you spent half a life cleaning him up. Now people stare and stir, like the way we nervously look around at the hiccup of sirens or an engine shaking for way too long, or the orange bucket filled with blue and gr green clothespins rattling under an empty line, or how your only good shoe kicks and crushes around the gangway rack. I think I could read. We have five minutes, right? Okay. People are fading out because they're too close to the mic. Did you get your, your, you're muted. Um, yeah, her voice disappeared through about 20% uh, of that poem, poetry reading. Sorry, sorry. For others, just uh, don't get as close to the computer, I guess. Okay. Sorry. Um, I may no longer be a child flying my way around Earth. I may be walking into a dream. Sit, pull open the doors. The silence, perhaps, is a departure for myself and then a return at 2 o'clock. No one comes and unbuttons his coat. No one will not step in closer to decipher me. I lean out of dark. I lean out of darkness with a flame. I remember, the full sun pretends like I didn't blow through my savings. A roar fills up the last wolf when I check my balance, and it makes me shake like a stone. So be it. In nature, there is death, pale and strong, sculpted in my heart. I am loved the same way I love the locust tree at a and there is wind, my dove, blowing through all that lives. I am loved by a, a felon in the pul pulpit, pouring colors onto the ground and daring me to fall face first like a leaf, give away my money and count myself lucky. I reach behind the horror of my life just to tell the beauty of holiness. Don't try and kid me. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, life is sweet. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. Um, I'm going to ask Jim Madigan to read a poem or two for us. Thank you, Elle. I'll read two. And try not to fade out. Uh, this first poem is called Marengo. Off the highway, out of our way, on the way to Galena, Sandy's Cafe, filled with jackets of lumberjacks, of camo, of fluorescent orange, 
We were the strangers from not there. Sliding into a booth, ordered pancakes and sausages, patties, not links. I dropped two quarters in the jukebox, punched K5 and K7. Frank Sinatra, Strangers in the Night. The chatter exchanged for a smiling silence, just for a moment. But I could feel a new relaxed tone when table conversation resumed. The B-side, young at heart, brought nods of acknowledging goodbyes. As we finished our coffee, slipped on jean jackets and headed west. Thank you. And the second poem um, is a poem that I would say is uh, after a poem by John Asbury. And it's called, Do You Want to Dance? And I'll mention there's a little uh, there's a little nod to Little Richard, which uh, Richard Nestor gave a little nod to Little Richard in his poem. Good golly, Miss Molly, twist and shout, tutti frutti, Papa umau mau, da do do da 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 da, do a diddy diddy, land of a thousand dances, dance to the music. Dance, dance, dance. Do you want to dance? Dance with me. I'm happy just to dance with you. When you dance, I can really love. Dance me to the end of love. Tainted love. Where did our love go? Moon dance. Harvest moon. Shine on you, crazy diamond. Save the last dance for me. Wake up, little Susie. Wake up, everybody. We got to get out of this place. Life during wartime, something in the air, change is gonna come, dancing in the dark, dancing in the moonlight, dancing in the streets. There's a riot going on. Tear the roof off the sucker. Street fighting man, playing with fire, burning down the house. Time is on my side. Stand by me. Imagine, people have the power, power to the people. Thank you. Thank you. So if I'm not mistaken, um, we have one more person in our open mic and that is Sarah Ray. Sarah, good to see you. Thank you, it's great to be here. Thanks to Nina and Al and Kurt and wonderful to hear Tim and all of you all. Um, so um, I'm, I, I have one poem that referenced is uh, pandemic and the other one does not. So it's I haven't written about the current results of the election yet. Um, uh, so yeah, just uh, start with olives and isawara. We couldn't stop eating them, black wrinkled cured, deep complex flavor complementing French bread, sweet butter, honey, cafe au lait for breakfast in the mornings. Later we'd walk the winding streets of the Medina venture to the waterfront and feast on fresh shrimp and flounder. The cats there did not have plush coats. Matted fur and loose skin hung from their bones as they howled for scraps from fishermen. I needed to buy presents for friends and family back home. Purple and red silk scarves interwoven with gold strands. The shop wrapped them up and included their business cards on top, ones you later snipped off without asking. The fact they wanted to advertise their shop was offensive, you said. You got a shave, the old fashioned kind with a straight razor from the barber. One misstep and there would be blood. We came so close. I'm searching for those olives now, this cold and snowy Chicago winter. I want to bathe in sun-drenched light as it filters through frost-covered windows, tear back the fragile skin of memory, savor velvet flesh. I want to watch the mound of ebony pits grow on my kitchen table as I scrape the last bits of salty earth from the stones with my teeth. Thank you. Okay. And uh, one more uh, Chicago poem written in, uh, in August. 
after that big storm that we had. At the corner of Lawndale and Cullum, August 2020, Grandpa's porch chair was wooden, green, and curved, so his butt would fit in easily. He'd get up at about 4.30 or 5, sit on the porch and look out at the backyard, his barn, the fields, not reading, not listening to the radio, maybe chewing on a toothpick, gazing for a while, a long while. 50 years later, I'm sitting on my street corner in Chicago on the grass in front of the building. I don't have a balcony. I'm in my red and white lawn chair, the kind that rolls up in a bag you carry on your shoulder. It's the middle of the pandemic. My mask is at my side. There's been a horrendous storm a few days before. Tornadoes have spiraled through Chicago, a once a century occurrence. Trees have fallen on cars. Mine has been spared. I take another bite from my sausage McGriddle. It's not a chicken one since they made a mistake with my order. I'm contemplating the pros and cons and pandemic risks of driving to Union Pier, Michigan to see my cousin and her kids who are staying there in an Airbnb, thinking again about how everything is more complicated due to COVID. Across the street, a middle-aged woman in a mask like the beak of a bird pushes a stroller filled with items she's probably just purchased from Tony's Finer Foods. Another woman, maskless, wearing a pink sweater and white pants, why a sweater on a hot August day like this, emerges from her late model SUV and enters the red brick condos that were originally apartments. A young mother pushing a stroller, this one with a baby and a little dog in tow, greets me from an acceptable social distance as she passes by. I don't see any men. Grandma had a chair too. Hers was inside in the living room in front of the TV where she would sit every weekday to watch As the World Turns, followed by Love is a Many Splendored Thing and The Guiding Light. I'd watch the shows with her when we'd visit and she'd on how the characters had previously gone about their lives. Her my bedroom now. The pink rose covered footstool she always used sits in front. No construction workers out yet. It's way too early for cicadas or mosquitoes. Birds have stopped chirping for a while. Trees canopy the street. Air conditioners hum. I look at my watch, mull the time, the tasks of the day, reposition my rear on the seat, gaze ahead. How much longer can I sit? Can I take to sit, breathe in the essence of this place, this corner, grab hold of roots that will ground me as I move through the coming hours? Thank you. What a great open mic. Thank you all for uh, being part of it. And uh, Al, what's um, next? I, just, um, I wanted to answer on YouTube. Patricia Smith asked if uh, Tim is still reading, and he's about to come up if you're still there, hopefully. <laughs> Hi, Patricia Smith. <laughs> good to not, I, it would be good to see you, but it's good that you're out there. Um, so, do we take five minutes? All of a sudden, um, I've forgotten. I, I think it's, it gets a little awkward on, on uh, live streams to take a break, as we do in the real world when we can. But okay. We should and move ahead. Kurt, um, did you and Tim talk about whether there was anything you were going to broadcast of uh, Tim's information or books? Uh, or no. Uh, I didn't. I didn't hear from Tim. I apologize, but uh, uh, you've got the bio. You've got the bio uh, to read from and talk to both of you. And Tim, you can introduce yourself and fill us in where where Nina might not. I just so, wanted to uh, read some poems, man. Yeah, exactly what people say. So here it goes. So I couldn't be more thrilled to have Tim here. Um, the first time I encountered Tim's work, uh, Tayemba Jessen wandered into um, my series at uh, the Gourmand Cafe. And uh, he read a poem from one of Tim's books, um, Hammerlock. Um, should I wait? Um, until these pictures finish. Oh, I see. Yes, that was uh, Tayemba right there. Um, so yeah, he comes in, he reads this wonderful um, poem and I, and we both 
started to conspire uh, to see if we could get him in to read at the Guild Complex. Now, Tim, we probably did let you know about that. We totally failed uh, to get you in. Right. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> by the time by the time that happened, uh, the executive director was a, a prose writer and money was low. And so here we are. One of the um, advantages of, of COVID time is being able to have you here and yet not here. <laughs> Tim is the author of several of uh, poetry collections, including Hurdy Gurdy, Hammerlock, Buffalo Head Solos and Fast Animal, which was a finalist for the 2012 National Book Award, and uh, the winner of the Theodore Ruthke, um, pardon me if I just mispronounced his name, Memorial Poetry Prize. Um, Tim is a former NEA fellow and recipient of a fellowship from the Provincetown Fine Work Center. Um, his latest collection, One Turn Around the Sun, was released in 2017. And um, he's got a new and selected um, poems coming out sometime next year. So if you don't want to buy every single book that he's written, then <laughs> you may want to wait for that to happen. Um, Who's publishing it, Tim? It'll be Etruscan. They're the same people who did Fast Animal and One Turn Around the Sun. Cool. And, you know, he just recently completed a two-year appointment as the Poet Laureate of Virginia. And we're so lucky to have you with us, Tim. So go for it. And for you in the audience, um, we're going to have a Q&A afterwards. And um, so if you have anything that you want to ask, just type it in. Yeah. Um, Tim, j uh, just to let you know, I have a few friends saying hello. So. All right. <laughs> uh, hello, friends. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Patricia now and Afa. And uh, so uh, let's let you begin. <laughs> All right. OK, well, I'm going to start off with a, with a villanelle. Um, it's called the Polite Blues Villanelle. Um, and I, I like, I often combine, I use the title Blues Villanelle for all the Villanelles that I write now because I think the blues and the Villanelle form are related uh, anyway. Polite Blues Villanelle. I guess I'm just tired of being polite. My handshakes get flimsy. This smile's a dud. Wish I could sleep for the rest of my life. The sun always comes for its hungerless bite. I yell at my heart to work up my blood. I'd rather be snoring than being polite. You try to get dressed, but your blue jeans fit tight. Your body gone soft like you stuffed it with mud. Are you tempted to sleep for the rest of your life? It's been a long time since I slept through a night. Does everyone marry a head full of crud? And how can I do this, doing polite? What do you do when not doing feels right? Love rolls at the start, but craps out with a grudge. It'd be better to sleep for the rest of your life. I meant to do more, but my soul got the blight. Been trying to shake free, but the bullshit won't budge. It starts to wear thin, this wearing polite. I want to live rude, fly naked, and right. Probably should toss my bad brain in a tub. Then I'd be dead for the rest of my life. Distraction just ain't the same thing as delight. Am I crazy to sing with this mace in my blood? Guess I'm just tired of seeming polite. Some say I should sleep for the rest of my life. Mm. 
I'm, I'm working on a, I don't, I'm not sure exactly what to call the, the, the series officially, but I guess I'll call it the poem is a living thing series. So I've written a series of poems in which the poem itself is a character in the poem. I'll just read it and maybe it'll be clear what I mean. And the title of this poem goes directly into the body of the poem. It had been a long time since the poem had seen a sunset. Trees, tall buildings. I'll start again. Yes. It had been a long time since the poem had seen a sunset. Trees, tall buildings, black against the burnt orange sky. The breeze, soft like, like a sigh for a friend long dead. Nothing to do now but try to stay clean and think. The poem never tells anyone it had been incarcerated, which sounds like a way to cook meat. Afraid, always, kind of. Impossible not to remember certain faces, the hard quiet of men who crumbled like old bread. Even out here, this light, the feeling of being trapped, as if a country could itself be a cage. Something invisible, an idea, a germ, something had worked on everybody. Night now. The poem looks back at the city, sees the moon not up, two headlights shiving the dark. This is a poem called Knock Knock. In the, in the back of your mind, you, you're saying, who's there, right? <laughs> knock, knock. It's quiet, like a fly in a frog's mouth. Say something loud, but secret, like starlight banging on a bug's back. Something so true that just the suggestion unhands the clock. Why pretend that I'm not what I am? A hard on held by the head nun, that rogue fart in the flower shop, freak branch on the family tree, that mad song in a mum city. I am that misfit music, that two-headed kin, that whoops upside the head, ants in your pants, what can I say? I bum rush the world, find another world inside. That last chance, the lost dance, that ghost dance, come again. Who says we can't be free? This is an allegory called amusement park. Or maybe it's just a poem, I don't know. It could be an allegory, I suppose. Amusement park. Shuffling along, shouldering softly through the crowd. You don't remember the admission 
or planning to come. The rides look new, but it's mostly the paint. Every day the sun disappears and reappears as if unsure of the situation. Your parents used to talk about being young once. Now you wonder what they really wanted to say. Shadows scratch the sidewalk, popcorn, hot dogs, pizza, aromas stoke the breeze. Of course, fear takes the air too, like the kind of perfume you only notice when it's gone. You told your friends, I'm sick of this shit, but somehow here you are back in line, itching for the wicked flea, a ride famous for jumping the tracks, but the whole park is like that. Even the cross-eyed calico creeps low to the ground, ready to run as if any minute some bad surprise could rip it away from all the little it knows. Worrying this way, the cat is a lot like the people who come here to undo their daily lives built on hard work and scary news and bigotry, which usually moves around disguised as someone else. Wherever you turn, women, men, almost every hue, some skin so dark it holds a hint of stars, other faces white as paper, and the many complexions in between, dirty red, cinnamon gold, cocoa with a kiss of brass. Of course, the fear is shared unevenly with all these colors and the history they recall. But the people remain lovely, enticing, a smorgasbord, sooner or lady, sooner or later, ready to be consumed. And though strangers exchange harmless glances, each suspects the rest of playing a part in a story that seems impossible to explain. Like the park itself, both natural and not, both deadly and full of fun. The crazy crook is the scariest, guaranteed to remix your mind, the neon winks. Some get on with glee, some with stolid faith, but you go half doubting, half hoping it'll be all right. Like your parents said, though lately you haven't seen them on any rides. Its height is legendary, the loop-de-loops ridiculous, your friends believe it's the one ticket worth fighting for. That long first climb, the haphazard twists and dives, the whoops and shrieks, and every time somebody yelling, look, ma, no hands. Maybe the loudmouth is a superhero ready to pretend the courage that might make death and his shiny badge back off. Or maybe he's just another dumb chump begging to be noticed in a world that repaints and forgets, refuels and drives on. Sit your simple ass down, you snap, while the crazy crook rolls over those bone bending swerves that snatch the riders back to their busy, befuddled, stampeded lives out of hand and harder faster, as if some cranked up kidnapper has everyone locked in his trunk and won't stop stomping the gas. The days blur, each month honks by like a V of Canada geese. You spin around, your friends keep testing their new knees. How did you get used to this? When did you forget how to sleep? What made your parents play certain words over and over? Job, 
success, love, responsibility. And where, exactly where did they go? Okay, that's it. I'm never going to an amusement park again. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Here's a, let me read you this. This is a poem I, I wrote. It's a personal poem I wrote um, actually during uh, the eight years that W was president, which actually means Cheney was president. Um, and uh, I think of course it, it may still be pertinent, unfortunately, uh, given the, the, the last election. Uh, anyway, it's a, it's a poem in the voice of Blade, uh, the Daywalker. Uh, some of you know Blade is a vampire slayer. I'll, I'll read the introduction and I'll go right into the poem. Years ago, a pregnant woman was bitten by a vampire and turned. Her son was born with a thirst, but being half human, he could walk in sunlight unharmed. Though vampires quietly dominate the world, he fights them in part to prove his allegiance to humanity, in part to avenge his long isolation being neither human nor vampire. Because of his deadly expertise and weapon of choice, they call him Blade, the Daywalker. Like a stake in my heart, this life, the seen, the unseen, the ones who look in the mirror and find nothing but innocence, though they stand in blood up to their knees. You see them, shadows, not shadows, people who seem to be people. You don't believe me? I watch their news, drink coffee, in their chains. There's no place they haven't touched. It's almost like I can't wake up, like I'm living in a movie, a kind of dream, action-packed thriller. I never dreamed this hunger in my veins, this mind that cannot sleep. Why? Do I wet this blade when they will not die? Thank you. This is, a, this is another poem um, with the poem as a central figure in the poem. Uh, the title once again goes right into the body of the text. With no hat, no shirt, no pants, the poem walks the early afternoon. Summer sun spots the odd shape on the road and offers a cloud for shade. The poem is headed downtown with its revelations, its beauty, all the intricate parts finally open to the general public who, though they try to deny it, have always wanted to see beneath the vintage clothes. The poem's previous modesty and stealth, its humility and restraint, its patient, soft-spoken invitations have served no one really, not even the poem itself, which has always wanted the spotlight, the red carpet, the sequin gown, the top hat, velvet lapels, ruby slippers, all its big front teeth inlaid with gold. The first people the poem passes, look, look away, look again, their hope swelling like a fresh bump on the head 
One guy tries 911, but the nine begins to shimmy like a new disciple. And the man's afro bursts into cotton candy. The poem loves it, loves being out, being seen. The almost cool walk flips to a Denzel stroll. I'm kicking new flavor in your ear, the poem says unquietly, meeting the eyes of drivers who swerve so sure they see what must be a mirage, a buck naked angel rump shaken beside the witless sprawl of their lives, their heads anointed with apocryphal music. The cars refuse the road, their horns reborn, scatting a fanfare of funkadelic clarinets. This is my body, the poem says, take and eat. I'm, I'm always tempted to read new stuff. Maybe I'll read you an older. Uh, I'll read you an older villanelle. This is the zombie blues villanelle. It's from the last book. Zombie blues villanelle. There are days I believe there is nothing to fear. I rev up for green lights my engine on call, but it could be the zombies are already near. That sleep that we feed every day of the year, what's up with your friends when they circle the mall? There are nights when I think I have no one to fear. My mom watches Oprah to sweeten the year. You can keep your eyes open, see nothing at all but it might be the zombies are already near. You think life is supposed to be lived in this gear? Been asking that question till my brain has gone raw. Certain days I believed I had nothing to fear. I have dreams where I'm driving with no way to steer. You can growl like a cello. You can chat like a doll at the games. Ain't it always the zombies who cheer? I think fear itself is a whole lot to fear. I have watched CNN till it made my skin crawl. I might be a zombie that's already here. I've been pounding this door, but don't nobody hear. You can drink till you think that you're seven feet tall. Fast dances, good chances, and nothing to fear. You can fly through your days until time is a smear. Maybe blaze up the bomb or blog out a blog. There'll be days when you know you've got nothing to fear, but you could be a zombie that's already here. Hmm. All right. The poem that uh, that Nina was referring to, um, that Tyamba Jess brought uh, to this reading, um, it's it's from the diary of Kwai Chang Kane, Shaolin monk. I think most of you remember the series Kung Fu. This is his diary. I'll, I'll, I might leave out a couple of the entries, but. I'll give you the gist of it. Um, it was found in 1883 near McGehee, Texas. First entry. My life explained to flies would have them laughing. Two years ago, I killed the emperor's oldest son on the holy road to the temple of heaven. I buried a spear in his back because one of the royal guard shot my old teacher, Poe. 
He had stumbled in front of the prince's caravan. A good man lost because those with power have no time for those without it. And it must be strange believing the world was made only for you, that your wealth is proof that the breeze actually prefers your face. I thought I would die in China that day with the large bounty offered by the royal house and the random hangings, but the, but the people kept my shadow in their pockets. I have the robes that say I know killing does no one honor, that no injury is ever rightly avenged. But what do I do with the ache in my blood that was eased when I threw the spear? Now I am in Mescalero, New Mexico, America, a half white Shaolin, always only a few steps ahead of the price for my death. Mostly people here are hardworking and stupid. If an American has two thoughts, the first and the second involve money. Though skin lies simply along the surface of a man, people here think it is a sign of something deep. Grace, if you are white, fault, if you are not. There are places where I cannot get a glass of water. By my, by my eyes, they know I am not white, but by my height and color, they suspect that I am not, not white. Yesterday, I blinded someone for spitting on my food. He laughed, then I reached into his face. It happened so quickly, I swear, for that second, my hand belonged to someone else. I have seen black people and red also, and others not seen in China. To witness hate coming to live along the lines of skin. Suppose some rabid animal were roaming the countryside. Everyone would agree to kill it to stop it somehow. Here, it is as if the people would take this thing in and feed it. So quick they are to nurse this cruelty. When I killed the prince, I became sick in my stomach, though the royal house is yet famous for torture. When I killed the first assassin sent after me, it was like slapping a mosquito poised to suck from my wrist. Lao Tzu has written, one who recognizes all men as members of his own body is a sound man to guard them. I am a priest. I believe in living toward this, but often my anger occurs to me as its own creature with its own teeth. To those who would sleep through the wounds they inflict on others, I offer pain to help them awaken, sometimes death, to keep them calm. There is no question injustice can ask, to which violence is not a fair answer. The man who wanted to peel me, I helped him fit half his blade into his thigh, his right hand still on the hilt. The look on his face then, as if he had seen a sparrow swallowing a wolf. All my life, I have stood apart from other Chinese because I look white and here been out, outcast by whites for the shape of my eyes. Now I see beauty in the motions of revenge, the making of harm. So now I am not even Shaolin. But why should belonging be such a prize except to one who needs others to tell him his name? Membership 
is only another word for obedience. Obedience is for dogs and children. I know who I am, but where can I? <laughs> anyway, you're all very sweet. I think I've been reading, I've been reading for a while. I'd be glad to stop and, and uh, take some questions if you like. Um, I can always read another poem. I have way too many poems. I could read until everyone's head exploded, but I would, <laughs> I would, rather, I would rather just talk to people and, uh, and uh, talk poems or something. Well, you know, what we can do is maybe just run, you know, have some questions and then towards the end, as we get to nine o'clock, have you read a last poem. Oh, okay. All right. I didn't, I just didn't know what your timetable was. I didn't want to take it so late that everyone said, help us. <laughs> I want to tell everybody who's watching on YouTube right now, um, there's a number of people out there that um, there's a bit, there's about a 10 second uh, lag between our live Zoom um, call and what you see on YouTube, but I'm gonna monitor the chat on uh, YouTube. So if anybody wants to ask him any questions, go right ahead and I'll relay them. And also to let everybody know when we post the video of the reading, um, all the, the YouTube chat will be there. So Tim, you'll be able to see all your friends saying hi. Oh, okay, okay. Well, I'm I'm delighted that people have come. I, I just didn't know, you know, I didn't know I had the time right and all that since it's central time and, and east, yeah. east, east coast time. And I got it screwed up when we were talking today. So. Oh, it's all right. Um, Al, who are some of the other people out in YouTube land that are saying hello to Tim? Um, well, that's not, people that I know, uh, of course I know Patricia Smith's reputation. Um, she's there. Um, Patricia Smith, my heroine. Lynn Thompson, uh, Tara Burke. Oh, of course, I know Tara Lynn, yeah. Michael Todd uh, Galloglass. Um, and I guess Lynn's on Pacific time. Um, okay, oh, so Lynn's on the West Coast, okay. Yeah, and then um, let's see, another friend, um, it says, Chris says hi, but the uh, the name of their account is Affa Weaver, so. Um, oh, know who that is. Yeah. Affa Weaver, it's-, it's Oh, Affa, Affa Weaver? Affa, Affa. Oh, Michael Affa Weaver, of course. I, I know that is. Of course, I know who Michael is, of course, but you said Chris, so I didn't know. Afa says it's me and Chris, so he's with. He's oh, with oh, his wife. Oh, of course, of course, of course, of course. Makes sense. Got you. Sorry, sorry. Anyway, questions, chat, whatever. I'm yeah, happy. So I'm grateful to all my friends for being being here. Can I so, ask a question? Sure. I'm gonna, the, the first question I'm going to ask, I warned you about, which is, is. Uh, in light of putting together um, your new and selected, um, how would you say your writing's changed over time? Well, you know, it's, it's, that's, that's a complicated question, but um, I, I think a couple things. One is, um, I think the longer you write, it's, it's like playing a musical instrument, um, I think. If you play an instrument for a long time, the things that you understand about about the instrument that you that you don't have to think about any longer that you that you know kind of in your bones and I think for poets um, and writers of of any uh, genre if you when you write for a long time I think there is a point at which your subconscious understandings of of composition and of of the sound of of English for for my purposes English. Um, I think they become part of you in a way that they were not early in your writing career. So there's certain kinds of connections that you can make, certain kinds of, for lack of a better term, moves you can make intuitively that you would not have been able to make earlier in your life. It's hard to give an example of that. I, if I had my 
if I had a screen share, I could say, see this poem I wrote when I was 25 and look at this one, I wrote at 50. And then you can see maybe some difference, I don't know. But, uh, but I think that's what the difference is. I think you make, I think you often make uh, in the simplest sense of the word, better choices about language maybe. But the other thing that changes is your experience as with all of you, everybody here, you know, your, your living changes you. Um, there's a certain kind of, I think when I was in my twenties writing, I had a, a kind of, not, I wouldn't say blind optimism, but a pretty generous vein of optimism running through my soul about the possibilities of this country and, and the world, truthfully, um, in terms of how we might improve the ways in which we take care of each other as human beings. I think in the 40 years that I've written since my mid twenties, that is a much harder thing to hold on to. Um, you begin to see the world in, in, in many ways I still think people are beautiful and I still believe in human beings and the human heart, but you also understand that there are certain kinds of evil that are really entrenched, that are really have deep roots. I mean, I think the, the presidency that we've just been through and that we will continue to go through for the next two months is a marker of that. Um, I don't, I mean, I don't know some of you, I can't imagine some of you would necessarily be Trump voters, but you, it's, I could be wrong and I apologize. I don't mean to offend. Um, but I found that this era uh, that Trump almost was successful in ushering in really dangerous. And the idea that so many people felt that that was a person who should run this country really frightened me. And I don't know that I, will, I can get back to what I felt before his rise to the presidency. And I think um, this would also be true of the W presidency as well. Um, less so the Reagan presidency, but there were several things that made me think the world is not the way I think it is. And I think there's a, there are aspects of being conscious if you're concerned about life and believe in the possibilities of human society being a place that's livable. You, you begin to feel that maybe it's going to be a way harder to accomplish than I initially thought. And so that's changed the way I write too. I think there's a, 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 a heavier shadow in my, in my work. Um, I think despair has a larger place in my sensibility than it did certainly 20 or 30 years ago. And so those are some ways it changes. The other thing, of course, it changes is you're, you're, you become more intelligent. You, you know, you learn more things about how language works and and you understand certain things. You've read a lot, you've read other poets, you've thought harder about what language does. So those are ways in which your work changes. Do you find that your, your, your penchant for what you like to write about or how, um, or you know, like the forms you might use has changed? Do you write as much persona now, persona poetry now as well, you do? I have not written as much persona as I once did, but I may, that could have, I could certainly do more persona poetry. It's funny that you'd ask, um, I just finished a poem in the voice of Denmark Vesey, um, uh, who was a slave uh, who planned a rather elaborate uprising um, uh, in North Carolina um, in the 18, I guess, I think the 1820s, I believe. And I just finished a poem in his voice. So I, I, still, I still love the idea of persona and the, and the dramatic possibilities of persona. Um, but you know, the poems in which I was reading tonight in which a poem is the character, well, that's the kind of thing that I probably would have never conceived of 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. But so that's something else, but that could just be me, I'm, I'm going slightly insane. That's possible too, right? Um, yeah. But so there are certain things I would do in terms of strategy that I might not have done otherwise. Also, I've written a lot of villanelles. Like I've, I've been working a lot on that form, trying to stretch it and do things with it that W.H. Auden, for example, might not have done. But I love Auden and I respect what he did with the villanelle. But I've done, I try to do more variations with the rep repeating lines. Mm -hmm. And I also extend the, the form. He, uh, the official, quote unquote, official form of the Villanelle is 19 lines. And all of my Villanelles, except for the very first one that I, I wrote 
when I was in my 20s, actually. All my villanelles since then have been 25 lines. So I'm, I'm doing things with that, thinking more about form, um, not in the strict iambic pentameter sense, though I'm, I really dig the 10 syllable line in the villanelle. I'm not trying to be iambic necessarily. I just really want the, the, the syllabics to, to work together more than I'm worrying about the stresses in the language. Um, so those are things I try now that I would not have thought about when I was 35, for example, or, or 25, you know? So those are some other things that have changed. Is there anyone in, go ahead. Uh, well, I get, we have a question out here in uh, YouTube land. Uh -huh. um, first, uh, Bill Harrison says, hi, Tim. Bill. And then, <laughs> Bill. And then we, we have a question from Millicent Accardi. Uh, as a writer, how do you see pop culture intersecting with Black Lives Matter and COVID? Well, I think to the extent that Black people you know, watch television and go to movies and listen, into, and listen to popular music, of course it has an impact on the way black people like white people or brown people or red people or yellow people. <laughs> I mean, it has an impact on what you think. I mean, I've written about cartoons. I also just wrote that, I just read that poem about Kwai Chang Kane. You know, I grew up watching Kung Fu on television. <laughs> it was a huge thing to me. I mean, it was my first encounter with what I guess you would call Taoism right or, or which i guess which would be related to buddhism in certain ways too so it was very powerful to me i didn't even know i was having a spiritual experience in some of those meditative moments some of you remember that series oh, yeah and, you know and you know they'd say certain things and you know what what was the thing um uh, uh what is it uh, when, there was a thing that the wise teacher poe said early in the thing which is something like what was it? Avoid rather than harm, harm rather than than maim, maim rather than kill. For all life is precious and cannot be replaced. And I've never forgotten that, <laughs> you know. And so, uh, and so that kind of thing, of course, has an impact on me as a black man. Of course, I'm thinking about these these issues. <laughs> Um, Buddhism, I certainly didn't grow up as a Buddhist or a Taoist, you know, I was raised in the Lutheran church, in fact. Um, but it certainly opened a window into another way of imagining myself spiritually. My, my own serious spiritual concerns are probably wildly unorthodox in many respects, but I have deep affection for Buddhism um, and Taoism. Um, but uh, of course, it all impacts the way you think. I mean, t take, for example, Black Panther, the movie. I mean, that's a, it's a very different way of imagining your, your experience as a Black person, think of Black superheroes, or a nation that is essentially, I don't know if you could say perfect, but a nation that was kind of like this grand and powerful place with brilliant minds and all these things. And that was the defining feature of Black, of, of, of Wak Wakanda, I think is the name of the country. And so like, I, I've never lived in a place like Wakanda, but I sure would like to. <laughs> you know, and so of course it has an impact on the way we think about <clears throat> uh, life in general, but black life in particular. Of course it does. You know, of course it does. I, I think I think pop culture is a rich place that we, sh I mean, as writers, that we can mine, that we can use um, in two ways. One, to draw people into the to a world, a, a literary sensibility to draw people in because they're familiar with certain. Um, characters and so on but it's also um there's the cartoons and movies it's rich if when you look at carefully with in terms of metaphor and, and allegory all kinds of stuff is going on talking about life you know to all people but certainly uh, black folks can can uh, use it to their own for their own you know sense of things too what else have you got al uh, nothing else from YouTube land. Well, there was one of our open micers. Was it Patty who had a question? Sure. Yes, Patty. Yeah. Hi. Hey. Um, this is my first uh, exposure to your work, Tim. I'm just so impressed and really enjoyed the entire thing. Um, as you got into the last, the diary, mm -hmm. I have to tell you, no, 
I was not a whatever you were, 10 year old boy in um, 1970. I do not know the Kung Fu stories at all. I don't oh, know. Oh, okay. Yeah, and, yeah. And some, a lot of people don't, and they think that that diary is a real diary, which is Well, fine. that was going to, that was <laughs> in the beginning, that was going to be my question. And I'm like, I can't ask that. That's just too embarrassing. No, no. It's I, caught it on, I caught on, but it, it's so fascinating that you are inhabiting a Chinese, uh, a historical, or not historical, but a, an ancient Chinese person, character, and bringing with it the Black Lives Matter and the blackness, the American black experience. I mean, I just love that. Well, I yeah, well, can't wait to read it. Can't wait to read it. Well, yeah, well, all yeah, the poem, well, I hope you enjoy the poem, but it, you can also probably, if you have, you could probably YouTube Kung Fu and see probably excerpts of the actual um, uh, series. But yeah, the thing that was cool is that uh, it was set in the, in the 1800s, the series. And so he escapes China because he's killed the emperor's son. He comes yeah. to America and he encounters, you know, all these things, white people, black people, indigenous people. And, uh, you know, he, he encounters bigotry in a way that he, at least to my sense of his, his life, he had never experienced exactly. Um, and so it's a fascinating thing because of course, all people, anyone who has suffered discrimination or hostility based on their faith, their, their skin color, their gender, their sexuality, whatever it is, of course, it, they have a million intersections. Of course, right. it intersects in a million ways. And so that's why I found him so interesting. Also, as a, as a Shaolin monk, he was so committed to peace, but he found himself without any alternatives <laughs> except to act in violent ways, which, which he, he was conflicted about, which is also something I think many uh, people uh, find themselves conflicted about. I mean, I am not, uh, as of yet, anyway, a person who's had to act violently. An but assassin. You do, Good. But, but you do have, um, you certainly find yourself enraged about things. You certainly find yourself battling the impulse to say, God, I wish I could rip that guy's face off. I mean, you kind of, you well, find that, yourself battling those impulses. That's exactly, that's exactly a query that I would pose. How how different is his experience in whatever it is in 20th century or 18th century, I guess, uh, early 19th century, century was a moment set. Um, America from whatever he was experiencing in China, which pushed him to murder someone. He's, he knows, he has known discrimination, apparently, some kind of a class based or well, a, I think class yeah class is maybe it was a woman I don't know but you know these things yeah, I think it was class well class is what I guess I would think because the monks of course the Shaolin were were not rich people so the the royalty would you know be certainly of another tier in the society but what caused him to murder the emperor's son was that when his his blind teacher stumbled in front of the the the, the emperor's caravan they he stumbled in front of it and they killed him they killed they killed Kwai Chang King's teacher. And so yeah. he reacted immediately. He did not think it looked like he reacted immediately and threw the spear into the back of the, of the, 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 the he couldn't see the emperor's son, but he threw it at where the emperor's son would be sitting and it killed him. Anyway. The emperor's son like, looked exactly like Donald Trump Jr. I'm just yeah, saying. maybe, <laughs> maybe, but you know, the, but, but I think um, as I was saying, anyone who's experienced a sense of being put upon, uh, treated badly because of class, race, gender, et cetera. I mean, rage is a part of our experience. I think my, my hope is uh, that as people, we will not be governed by rage, you know, <laughs> that we will be governed ultimately by a greater impulse toward recognizing each other's vulnerability and each other's need uh, for, for, you know, what Dr. King would call the beloved community where we look after each other. Now that's a big, that's a dream, certainly given the circumstances of our society right now. But I do think one has to hold to such things. You have to hold to the idea that at some point in the future, we will figure out who we are and that we will stop mistreating each other for idiotic reasons. That's, <laughs> at least that's my dream. Anyway. 
Okay, another query though. Is sure. it idiotic to kill someone because a loved one has been murdered in front of your eyes? Can you say it again? Is it, a, it Was it idiotic of this monk to kill the emperor's son who had murdered a loved one of the monk? Yeah, no, I, I wouldn't call it idiotic. Yeah. No, I mean, it makes perfect, it makes sense if, if you it's think- It's human, of, it's if human. You, yeah, if you think of revenge as a, as a legitimate response to cruelty, I would, I would, I would go so far as to say that the monk himself would have said it was probably not the wisest thing to do as someone who believed that life is the most precious thing and cannot be replaced. I, I think he was deeply conflicted ultimately about it. Um, but yeah, yeah, people, people will probably, if they feel put upon, they may do all kinds of things they may not be happy about. One of the things that interested me about that character is that. He was both, he was kind of uh, torn apart inside because I think he, he felt probably legitimate rage, you know, but at the same time, his highest calling as a Shaolin monk is to not kill. And so it's a very complicated thing. And I think, you know, if we, if we think analogously to our own lives, most of us, I think would work very hard not to hurt another person, even if we were angry. You know, and so we all battle that. I think we all have our moments when we are frustrated with people or with the society in which we find ourselves, but we would, most of us would probably choose to find another way other than violence to respond because violence ultimately begets more violence. It usually doesn't fix things. You know, it might fix things for a moment, but in the longer run, violence leads to revenge, right? I hurt you, you hurt me, I hurt you back, you hurt someone I know, I hurt you because you hurt them, and it goes on and on and on. So I think uh, the highest calling we, we have as people is to probably not go down the eye for an eye road, but to figure out a way to step beyond uh, mere vengefulness. Anyway, I don't want to get into that too heavy. <laughs> we have, a, we have a, a, a question or a good question a question from Patricia Smith, and I'll just read it. Okay. Uh, have you given much thought to working in other genres, novel, short story, et cetera? And are Absolutely. you- Absolutely. Are you I love, I, yeah, it, with like musicians, myself. visual artists, how about a novel in verse? Yeah. Uh, you know, I've, certainly, I've certainly done things with musicians many times. In, in Texas, when I lived in Dallas, I, I worked with a, a trio um, of musicians for many years. Um, so I love that, and uh, but I love prose, you know. I'm, you know, I'm, I love essays. I love short stories. I mean, if I was going to live to be a thousand, I would write, you know, novels, plays, essays. <laughs> I, mean, I love, I love all the genres, you know. So I'm working on, um, um, uh, but for the introduction of the the new and selected book that's coming out next fall, I'm working on an open letter, uh, which is an essay, basically talking about poetry and, and what, how I think of poetry in relation to my own work and, and to the possibilities uh, of uh, what it might mean in a society like this one. Um, so yeah, I love, I think of all the genres, I love them all and I, I play guitar. I'm learning more and more about guitar and that interests me too. I mean, I'd like to be able to speak in music, not only in, in words, but beyond semantics. In, in sound and harmony and melody. So I think, you know, there's, the world is a wildly fascinating place. I mean, if I could live to be a thousand, I would try to do damn near everything. <laughs> yeah. You're not tired yet. No, no, I'll, I'll be dead a long time. As, as the great poet David Ignatow once said, I'll be, I'm gonna be dead a long time. So, <laughs> you know, do as much as you can while you're here. Well, listen, Tara, I have a, I, uh, I oh, want to. Oh, that was me. I was. I have a question. <laughs> sure, sure, Jen. Yes. <laughs> After, as I answered the first question, my son asked me for apple juice. <laughs> so, um, so I have a um, a process question. I, as someone who has read your work for many years and had the opportunity to see you read. Um, Many times, I'm you know a huge fan, and what I appreciate so much about your work is 
you know, we talk about, um, or in, in poetry, we always have a reader in mind and poetry itself is intimate. There's, but there's a particular type of intimacy with, with your, with your writing that resonates with me and how it feels like this really deep inner voice that is a part, no matter who the reader is, it's just a, it's almost like it's your voice, but it's a voice inside of a reader. And I just am so curious about um, how you approach the page, sort of how, you know, because it just sounds so much like conversational and like it's breathing. And I'm always fascinated by poets who, whose work just feels like you're just talking and it just breathes on the page. And I'm like, how are you doing that? Mm -hmm. And so I'm really curious as to, you know, your process and how you approach the page or when you're starting a poem or how poems come to you. I'm really, I'm, yeah, I would love to know like what's that's, going on in your, in that's your head. That's or... a really great question. And I'm, I'm, I'm delighted that that's how you hear my, my poems, you know. Um, um, I think that in part, my approach to the page is, is rooted in the people I've read over the years. Like the poets that you love are the ones that at a certain point you internalize and they just become part of the way you think about writing and words. So people like um, I, for example, who was referred to earlier tonight, I was really critical to me and she wrote, wrote almost strictly in persona poems, almost exclusively in persona. Um, I was crucial and Sexton is a, was a total animal. Um, let me see who else. Um, I have great affection for Yusef Komunyaka. Um, I'm, just, I'm just giving you a few. In, in translation, of course, people like Pablo Neruda, of course. Um, Octavio Paz, of course. Um, uh, some of you, you may know a woman named Susan Stewart. She's probably not as well known as the other people I just mentioned, but she has a whole nother thing going. And so I think bit by bit, it, over the years, you read people and you internalize a certain sense of what words do. And then, as I was saying earlier, you, you've written and written and written and written and written. And I think the language becomes a part of you in a way that, that you're not even fully conscious of. So it isn't that I am trying to accomplish what you feel that I've accomplished, which I'm, of course, so grateful that you feel that way. But I think the intimacy um, that you may feel that, that resides or that, that seems to be expressed in those poems is really a function of having lived with words for a long time. And, and, I, and I try, in terms of process, I try to be really patient. Um, I do lots of revisions. Um, and, and one of the things that, that, that is a value to me is that I really want the poem to at least have a surface that is clear so that someone can enter the poems easily and then they'll find, I hope, they'll find that there are all these other levels of thinking and feeling going on, but the surface is, is open. Because I, I, I always disliked the poems when I was younger that I found difficult to enter, that I, I was confused by. I thought, I don't know what the hell's going on here, <laughs> you know? So I was, uh, the poets that I, I love, people like Mark Strand, I had, I really uh, admire. Um, uh, Lucille Clifton, maybe one of the greatest of, of creating surfaces that are completely transparent. And you walk in and there's so much going on. There's just so much going on in there. Um, and so those are the people that I read heavily. And, uh, and so maybe at some point they became part of the way I think about poetry in addition to the fact that I've written for a, at this point, certainly for a long time. And, and maybe there's a, a way of moving in language that allows me to, to express a kind of intimacy and directness that uh, I really, in many respects, I'm not conscious of anymore. It's just the way I think about poems. But I'm delighted, Jen, that you think those poems that work that way, that means a lot to me. Well, thank you, know, you so much for sharing that. Oh, <laughs> really appreciate it. <laughs> oh, sure. Hitting is a wonderful question. So I want to um, do say a couple of things um, and to think about what poem you'd like to end with. I okay. do want to say that I love uh, what you were just saying about the surface of the poem being an invitation uh, into the deeper levels of things and made me think of convertibles. Oh, yeah, 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 convertible. <laughs> a convertible <laughs> that allows you to convert. 
um, which in fact is, is, you know, what what a poem can do when it's written as as, as you do. So one other thing I want to say is that um, I think one of the best things that one can say about whether it's a poet or a musician or whatever is that he or she is generous. So they give you a generous um, performance. And I really got that tonight. And you have a generous soul. Oh, thank you. You're and very kind. I really want to thank you for that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you. You're very kind. I appreciate it. And the poets that, that I have admired and, and tried to, to model my own uh, way after, uh, I think were, were that way. Um, I was lucky enough to meet people like Merwin. Um, uh, I met Etheridge Knight years ago. I met uh, uh, Richard Hugo. Um, let me think who else. All these people are gone now. Um, Philip Levine, Philip Levine um, Galway Cannell. Um, you know, there are just a lot of people that they were very kind <laughs> and, they're, and their poems, they seem to just kind of offer poems, you know, that, like, uh, like cool water, <laughs> cool water on a hot day, you know, or something. And I, I've always hoped to be um, that kind of person uh, with poems. Um, and also the musicians that I love most, people like Jimi Hendrix, who was really the most important single artist in my, de my development, developing life. I mean, I discovered him when I was about 12 and there's something about how much he had to say with the guitar and how much he was willing to give uh, through, through that, that voice uh, that have stayed with me too. Anyway, I'm not gonna rant and rave like a madman, but yeah, I, I, I want, very much to be someone who, who is generous as, a, as an artist. Well, you know, um, I brought that up also as a segue into um, the, the idea that um, you have generously given your poems to us. It is a generosity for the audience also to buy our poets' books. <laughs> send a, con a collection plate, uh, <laughs> we would do so. But in the absence of that, please, please, please uh, buy Tim's books. They will be a gift to you and your reading them will be a gift to him. Well, I, I, hope, I hope so. If you find the books, I hope they, not, they, hope, I hope they, uh, they land well, I hope. But thanks for thanks for that, and uh, yeah, you know, buy the books, you know, or or. Uh, so this, do or, you uh, do you have one more poem you want to share? I with? do. I have a short poem that I think I will uh, I'll read. Um, uh, I think you know, given the the time we're in right now, um, I think this poem might be um, a good one for this moment. Uh, this is from Fast Animal. That's the book that you referred to earlier in the introduction. It's called From Darkness. Sunrise runs a fresh wind through the leaves. A night turns back into shadows. Waking up, the birds tell first light everything they know. Why do we keep killing each other. The earth is a woman who walks in the sky, walks in the sky. Her legs so long, you can't even see them. For no reason, the morning comes back again, saying, come back, open your eyes. Uh, thank you. Thank Everyone you. can unmute and clap. So that <laughs> bravo, bravo. Yay. Yay. Beautiful poem. Beautiful poem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're all very kind. <laughs>
Thanks, Tim. <laughs> Thank it was great. And I love the open mic, too. I didn't get to say anything except wave and, and make pictures, but I love the open mic. And people were knocking it all out of the park left and right. So I want you to know I dug it a lot, you know. <laughs> A lot Thank of fun. You. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks yeah. to everybody. It was a. It was. Yeah. A it was event. great. It was really. It was fantastic. I want to thank everybody who's been watching out on YouTube. And uh, like I said earlier, we're gonna we're gonna post the the whole video of tonight on on YouTube, and uh, you'll be Tim. You'll be able to see people's comments there. Okay. All right. Cool. Cool. That's yeah. great. That's nice. I appreciate. it. Are we gonna see us? Are, do we look like the Hollywood Squares on YouTube? You do. We do. I <laughs> think we do. <laughs> No, not on YouTube. On YouTube, it's the speaker view. <laughs> oh, okay. Because I, I see every, oh, I don't want to see everybody, but I see uh, yeah. 12 people or 12, 11 people and a, and a square with a name in it. So yeah. yeah, but we are not the Brady Bunch, okay? Right. We, 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 the Parsons family. Look at you, you know. <laughs> Not going on. Anyway, it was great. And I thank you, Nina and and, uh, and Albert, for having me and all of you for being with me. And I appreciate it. I know it's it's uh, it's been a, lo a lot of poems. Our brains are just throbbing with poems. <laughs> <laughs> One more poems. Come to the reading tomorrow. The plague papers. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, my God. Soon. Don't do it. Poems <laughs> and vampires. Thanks. <laughs> Not no vampires. All right, uh, See you later. Night Thank you so much. Good night. Right. Good night. Thank great you, everyone. See you. Thank you. So, yeah, great, Jen. It was great. Thank you. Good Richard, night. Richard, Good night. Good night. Good night. Nina, Thank you so much. Deborah, Ray, Bob, everybody. We should do this again. Yes. <laughs> well, well. It'll happen. <laughs> You'll have to count on it. Mm -hmm. okay.